नमस्कार सब जान आज एट इंट्रेस्टिंग टपिक भन न्यूरो बायोलॉजी अफ प्लांट डॉक्टर्स पर्स्पेक्टिव में आने हुए सब बोटनिस्ट न्यूरो सर्जन न्यूरो साइंटिस्ट आदार्थी थुप्रे आगे सुने तो अब यह बोटनिस्ट अल ओवर ने अर्गनाइज कर प्रोग्राम हो रहा न्यूरो सर्जन ले बोटनिस्ट को अगाड़ी बोटानी को खोजता मैं डर भी लगी रहे तरपनी कति कुछ फरक आँखा हे प्लांट फरक आँखा हेखे फरक ढंग ने बुझीने भाग आज मैं तब तक्ष प्रेजेंटेशन करने जमर्क कर अब कुबेर धन को बयान बना हेन र यो प्रोग्राम से विदेशी विभिन्न देश विदेशी सुनी रहने मैं अंग्रेजी में प्रेजेंटेशन कर अनुमति दिवला सो डियर फ्रेंड्स कलिग्स टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट कॉमन नॉट अ वेरी कॉमन टॉपिक बट क्यूरोसिटी अमंग मेनी पीपल्स Uh, whether plant have got any um, cognition, uh, perception, their understanding, their memory. Uh, how do they perceive light? How do they uh, do they hear sound or do they make sound? You know, there are a lot of things that we are curious about plants. So I'm going to talk about this from a doctor's perspective. I'm not a botanist. so you know it's a you can take it as a layman's perspective of neurobiology of plants and uh, if you have missed uh, if you if you miss my program uh, then uh, uh, this program will also be in the youtube uh, we have a show called the ethi show you can log in to the ethi show and search for this program and then also listen if you miss during the presentation uh so uh, the first agricultural revolution which is happens about 1200 and so years ago uh, this is the first time human uh, started departing from the nature you know and uh, and we started you know utilizing nature more and more towards our own uh, need and we domesticated animals and we domesticated uh, plants also um and that made a lot of prosperous development in the world but then that also caused a lot of uh, negative impact and um, the divides of have and have nots and uh, lots of different uh, wars and a lot of different conflicts uh, has started from you know the basis of agriculture revolution and um, otherwise we were living as a hunters and gatherers and you know we are only worried about today and uh, that could have been a, a much better life but uh, having said that i don't mean that we have to go back to caves again but then this is something that we have missed and uh, and also because of our own you know uh, involvement with the nature Uh, without respecting it uh, in a better way uh, we have destroyed destructed uh, the nature in a bigger sense and uh, recently lockdown taught us uh, how we were treating our environment uh, and how after lockdown we went down but then the environment got better uh, and in this as in this picture you can see that kathmandu valley became really really pollution free during that period uh so um, this is just because we stopped interfering with uh environment a little bit less during this long time period uh i go to forest quite often i, I am also a nature lover i do bicycling and go to the nature many times this is a picture from chitwan national park in nepal and uh, when i look at this picture then i can see that you know the forest is living on its own it has got its own ecosystem 
and it doesn't need nourishment to survive. Uh, it doesn't need a, a daily laborer. It doesn't need a manager. It doesn't need a political system. Um, it doesn't need an economic system. And without a religion also it's living. So, you know, pure Christine, just survival is the only thing that they are concerned about. But, uh, uh, you know, as we go on, if you look at this slide, uh, if you look at, if you compare the cell to cell comparison of the whole world, um, the biomass of plants uh, occupying uh, the universe, the earth, is 1,000 times more than human beings. And uh, so it's big, very big mass is being occupied by the plants. 1,000 times they are occupying more. And uh, without uh, intelligence, they would, without an intelligence, they would not have survived and grown and thrived to this situation. And 18% of the plant biomass is being eaten by uh, us and the land animals, uh, including other animals. And in the um, sea, there's, it's about 30 times the animal biomass is more in the uh, sea than in uh, the earth. That's a very, very interesting uh, data for me. So how long have they been, you know, surviving like this without any intervention? Uh, as we know, intervention is destroying them, but then without intervention, how long have they been like this? So if you look at the Pando uh, colony, uh, uh, Quacking Aspen in Utah, America, this plant is 14,000 years old. And uh, so 14,000 years means almost prehistorical for us. And, but then they saw no sign of uh, dying pretty soon, you know. They, there seems to be uh, going to be leaving for maybe thousands and thousands of years from now on. And actually the root connections that they had uh, have a uh, age of more than 80,000 years. So they have survived 80,000 years um, means that there must be a lot of understanding of the nature uh, and uh, you know the technique to survive the nature, uh, which they don't shout like we do, but then uh, they have it within themselves. And uh, so 80,000, what does 80,000 mean? So 80,000 means uh, it's before any uh, religion was there, before any politics was there. And, uh, you know, just some of us started uh, walking erect. So 80,000 is somewhere around here. There are some missing link. And uh, so they must have been pretty smart to live like this. And uh, now what's happening to the human beings? there has been a tremendous amount of technology. This is a graph of timeline and the times of cumulating number of significant intervention, invention uh, is, is in the Y axis and in the X axis is the timeline. Then you can see that it has risen in such a tremendous period of time. And if you actually look at the recent development, then within two to, you know, within, within last two to three, 300 years, there has been the most significant change. And a graph like this is not healthy actually. And um, it, I feel like this is going to collapse. It is not going, the graph like this do not sustain for a long, long time, unless we intervene. So, here is a computer chips on the tip of a finger and our brain is also getting smaller and smaller, but then it's getting smarter and smarter. Uh, the same way computer is also getting smaller and smaller, 
but it's getting smarter. So how fast is science growing? Science is growing very, very fast. The doubling time of a computer is uh, only two years. So if you buy a computer today, in two years time, the value of that computer becomes you know, two times less. So if you, and this is in, you know, the increase is in geometric proportion. So if you look at this figure, then it is again a J curve. We call it a J curve. And uh, in 10 years time, the computer is going to develop 1000 times of what we have now. So you, you, we cannot predict future. So this is, we can't say what is going to happen in the future, 10 years, 20 years, we cannot say, it is not possible. To, you know, compare. We can hypothesize, but we cannot predict. And um, uh, unfortunately, every patient that comes to me asks about their future to me. Doctor, what I'm going to be? What is going to happen to me after 10 years? So I say, I cannot tell. I don't know my future. I cannot tell your future. Uh, so coming back to the plant and animal, the all building blocks of the plant, whether it's a plant or an animal or a, a stone or whatever, is an atom. And uh, uh, even subatomic particles, and there are electrons, neutrons, protons, and there is a and there is an energy that is moving, and there is so you know quartz uh, particle, you know different. Uh, sub-nuclear particles. When you look at these, then plants and animals should have no difference. They look the same. And uh, if you look at the cosmos like this in this picture, it also looks similar to me, you know, and it is also spinning on, on nucleus, uh, like an electron moving around the nucleus. And uh, even the stones have the same, you know, uh, molecule. So in Eastern philosophy, in our philosophy, we believe that the stone also have consciousness. Water have consciousness. This has been told many, many times, you know, and uh, depending on how the water is being treated, it, it crystallizes differently. So in the same way, we, we think everything has consciousness. We believe in that. And this is because of the basic molecular structures, most likely. And we also you know, worship the nature. We worship the stone. We worship the river, the mountain, everything. We worship everything in the universe. You know? So coming down to hardcore, uh, uh, science. Everything started from a uh, unicellular organism, the tree of life, and then it subdivided with mutation actually and uh, into different uh, organs. And then, you know, plant separated, animal separated, and within the plant also there is, um, you know, hierarchy of plant and angiosperm, the, um, the flower giving plants with seeds uh, occupies the highest uh, place in the plant kingdom. So, and then there is uh, some organism which is disapp disappearing and there are new organisms which is appearing, you know. So this is happening all the time. So from algae, green algae to angiosperm, from a unicellular, you know, amoeba or whatever, a human and other animals have developed. We all know about this. So today I'm going to talk about, can plant perceive different stimuli? Uh, that is uh, spatial information. Spatial information is information in the space, whether they know up and down, down means gravity, up means sky, right, left, front, back, 
north, south? Do they know time? Do they know touch? Do they have no calendars? Can they read calendar? Do they have sound of their own? Do they smell? Can they smell? And can plant listen? Can plant talk, memorize, learn, or even predict what's going to happen next? And communicate with each other and pass this knowledge to the next generation. If they can do all this, then they are no different from human beings. Um, and if you look at the animal kingdom also, all animals don't do the same thing, you know. Different animals have different capabilities. But when we say animal kingdom, we say all these characters are within the animal kingdom. In the same way, single plant will not be able to do everything that I've just mentioned, but then majority of plant may be able to do, which I'm going to explain. Uh, so my interest in botany was, uh, you know, uh, by following this lady uh, around the mountain, uh, Bizea. Bizea Pant, uh, she is a botanist, my wife, and uh, working in central department of botany. And uh, every successful woman, they say that every successful woman have a crazy man behind. And I'm the crazy man who have been taking pictures, carrying our bag all around the hills. And then I started, you know, pondering these ideas. What about neuroscience uh, in plant? You know, I'm a neuroscientist and how they react. I, all, all, whenever I go, I feel like that. So this is how I started my study. And uh, some of my knowledge are from uh, straight from... Uh, the jungle, but some from the a book and many from the, obviously from the internet. So if you look at this picture, uh, you know, he's a past president, Donald Trump. So we want to know whether he's a good man or a bad man. And then we depend on a search engine, which is called the Google. Google don't give you any information. I don't believe in that. It just tells you what you want to hear. If you want to hear that Donald Trump is the best man in the world, then just type, Donald Trump is the best man in the world. Then you have you know, millions of views within less than you know, one minute. So how, half a minute you get you know, millions and millions, sometimes billions of fans. In the same Google girl, immediately, if you type, Donald Trump is the worst man in the world, then again, you have millions and millions of result. So Google is not an answer. It is just a search engine where you go and search with a preoccupied mind. You already have a preoccupied mind and you just go there and ask these questions. And actually, once you go in to Google and start searching, then they will hack your mind and they will start telling you what you should know. So if you type about type, if you want to go to Bali and then type about Bali, then another century you will be followed by, you know, Google telling you where to stay and what to eat and this and that about Bali. You know. uh, and Google is not a place for critical analysis because if you look at this figure, the left one is uh, what is the most common thing that people searched in Google in 2020? Coronavirus, election result, Kobe Bryant, Zoom, and IPL. Okay. And if you look what they searched in the USA, then it's election result, which was second in the world, came out to be one. And coronavirus, COVID brand, coronavirus, coronavirus. So this tells you that the people that search the Google does not represent the whole world. It, it clearly shows that this is the replication of US search, the Americans people searching is being reflected on Google's. 
Kobe Bryant, many of us even don't know who, who Kobe Bryant is. He's a famous, I also searched for him, and famous basketball player who had a helicopter accident and died. Sorry to hear it, very, very sad. But m many people in our part of the world don't even know Kobe Bryant. But he was, you know, in both, it was the third person to be searched. So uh, just to tell you that, you know, I have not put all these information just from the Googles. I have done my own type of research. So if you look at this nervous system of human body, then we, we have got a brain-centered thinking process where everything is controlled by the brain. And then that goes to the central nervous system and the spinal cord and to the nerve all over the body. And uh, if you look at the neuron itself, then the neuron has a nerve the one uh, axon and multiple dendrites and the nuclear the nucleus is there. And then it is an electrical signal that comes from here and there's a synapse and it connects with another nerve. And there are chemicals, structures that passes from one synapse to the other and then another electrical signals goes to, down. And this is how the nerve signals propagate from one place to another. And uh, the plant also have uh, several molecules usually associated with animal nervous system because these synaptic chemicals are very, very important. Electrochemical signaling, we call it. So nervous system also have glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, melatonin, and serotonin. This is also present in the plant and also in the animal. But they don't have a nervous system with a brain-centered sort of thought that we have. But uh, uh, we can adapt to our surrounding. Plants can also adapt to their surrounding. And uh, uh, we can learn, they can also learn. They, we can memorize, they can also memorize, you know. So as a person, we have, uh, with the uh, stimuli that we get from around, uh, we memorize this, learn, predict, communicate, pass this information to next generation, which is collectively known as intelligent. And our brain controls the whole body. But what controls the brain? Nobody knows. Why? Where is the controlling mechanism that starts in the brain? Is it something above the head? Nobody knows. So in the same way, plant also do not have a central brain, but then they are communicating somehow. So I will give you a very interesting, um, from this interesting uh, information. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Savan Ranch in America. And this is a big, big dry area where uh, uh, antelopes are, uh, these uh, antelopes are left just like that. And then they go and graze and graze and graze. And there is very little water here. And so suddenly they found that a lot of antelopes started dying. Nobody knows why. Then they started uh, studying what's happening. Why this antelope is dying? There's no killing marks. There's nothing, but they are just dying. And in hundreds, they are dying in these ranches. And they found that in the ranch where there is more antelope, more antelope were dying. This was a very, very surprising uh, for them. So they did some autopsy on these antelopes, cut them open. There was no organ failure, no heart attack, nothing. But then they, uh, they took out the intestinal content and then saw that the intestinal content had a lot of tannin. Tannin is a chemical that is produced by a plant to repel um, some insects so that it do not get infected. But how could a plant with so little tannin kill a big antelope. It was a big surprise. Then they re realized that the concentration of tannin in their blood was very, very high. So what was happening was this antelope was communicating 
with each other through ethylene gas. And then when some antelope come here and start eating, they produce this gas and tell the other plants that, oh, there are antelopes, they are eating me. And they, it's so dry and they're eating me so much that I'm going to die, uh, you know, I'll be finished. So before I finish, I must kill them. So they produce so much tannin that they kill the antelope. And they pass this information through gas to the another tree. And then they also produce tannin and then the antelope that went and started grazing on those uh, trees, uh, you know, trying to eat all the leaves in the trees. If, if they eat all the leaves on the trees, then they will die. So they have to protect themselves. You know, they have the right to protect themselves. Yeah. So this is a very, very surprising communication intelligence that I witnessed. And this is, uh, I took out from New Wellness Living. So as we all know, you know, smell, plants can smell. Now we know plant can smell. So infected uh, plants, if, if I have infected plants, they uh, produce different kind of odors, uh, methylene gases, jasmonate, salicylate like things, and uh, which can be perceived by the neighboring plants, you know, and they also know something is wrong in, in this vicinity and they also produce the same kind of uh, uh, chemicals to defend themselves. Or this can attract, because a, a bug is eating the plant, this can attract a bigger insect, like in this case, a wasp. Uh, this smell can attract a wasp and the wasp will you know, kill it and then the plant is safe. So this is intelligence. If you don't have a, this, this kind of intelligence, then you cannot survive. So this is there. Um, this is a photo I took from Orchid Conservation uh, World Society. And uh, uh, is orchid the most intelligent plant? Uh, I don't know, but then it looks like that. Because uh, to pollinate, we all know, the, especially the botanists know that they will have uh, the food reward system and the insect goes there and then, you know, they try to suck out uh, the uh, food. And then while doing that, they get pollinated and then they fly to another plant and then they pollinate the another plant. So there's a food reward that do, they do. Or sometimes they have no food, but then they show them that there is actually a food, you know, and then uh, this deceive other peoples by showing that actually they have a food. And then the, another insect goes there and then, you know, pollinate, but then they don't get any reward. And uh, similarly, they look like a, a female insect or a male insect or whatever, and then, you know, sexual deception. So they think, oh, there is a another sex there and then go there and then pull it. So uh, orchid have got this, uh, is doing this in a very different ways. And I'm sure the botanist here, the learned botanist uh, listening to this knows this much, much better than me. Uh, another is that uh, the, the plants also are carnivores and they can also move. Uh, their diff movement is different from others. Like this carnivorous plant, is, is uh, eating up an insect which just comes into it and then, you know, just grasp. And so there is a sudden movement. So these, these plants have sudden movement and these plants have sudden uh, sensation also. And then they know which is the insect that they need to eat and which is the insect that they should not eat and they may reject. And uh, like touch me not, uh, which is one of the most um, studied plant, uh, Mimosa pudica. And this plant also have memory and intelligence. Like if you, uh, Lazawati, we call it in our Nepali. So if you touch it, then it shuts down. But shutting down is a defense mechanism. It doesn't want to be kept shut because it's not a good position for them. It's, if it is open, then it's better for them for, uh, you know, uh, for photosynthesis and so on and so forth. So closing, stay closed is not a, but for a defense, it closes. But 
when it's raining, it doesn't close. So it knows, oh, this is a nature and this is raining. We, I don't have to close. There's no danger. So it can differentiate from a rain touch, from a human touch or other touch. So if that is not intelligence, then what it is? Um, again, there is a, a, a research done by uh, a very, very famous uh, botanist, a neuroscientist, uh, plant neuroscientist, who dropped this uh, toss me not plant from this height to almost the bottom, but not touching the bottom, you know, just dropped it like that, but then it stops on the middle. And uh, the initially the plant was so scared, it closed. And then when it was dropped more than 60 times, then it started learning that, oh, nothing is going to happen, you know. They, are, they have been doing this, but then nothing is happening to me. So it stopped uh, closing its leaf. Now it has learned something. It has memorized and it has learned. And then next time you drop it, it will not close its leaf. So there is a learning mechanism in plants that we, uh, that we can see. Uh, another is a mechanosensor. Uh, this is uh, behind uh, this photo I've taken, uh, uh, you know, by, behind uh, climbers. And uh, so the climbers will touch something and then they sense and then they start climbing up and up and up. So how do they know how to climb? This is very, very surprising. If you, if you think then this is <laughs> amazing. Uh, what is happening is one side, the bigger side, the con convex side is having more multiplication and the concave side less multiplication. And uh, they keep on going round and round and round and then catch whatever there and then climb. But if you stroke, if you don't give anything on climb, but if you just touch a plant many, many times on the same spot, just by a matchstick, let's say, then they start curling just like this. Uh, thinking that there is a match there and I need to grasp it. So it's a response to us touch, you know. Plant sometimes don't want to touch each other, each other's, you know, uh, which is called crown shyness. As in this picture, you can see that the leaves are not touching each other's. Uh, there is a clear cut gap between uh, each of the uh, branches and the leaves and which is called crown sinus in botany. I called it social distancing in COVID era because they don't want to spread infection from one place to another, especially the leaf eating, you know, uh, this larvae, they can travel from one plant branch to another. So protect themselves, they make uh, something like this. So this is a nature, intelligence of a nature. Now, Monica Glaciano, uh, Gal Galgliano, uh, this is the lady here and, uh, uh, who did that experiment. She has uh, written uh, the book, Thus Spoke the Plant. So she believed that the plant speaks. And uh, she has, in this uh, uh, exhibition, she has uh, placed some kind of, you know, uh, radio wave that can pick uh, radio sound and you can actually listen to the plants. So the plant make a sound, uh, the frequency of which is within our audible range. There are many sounds which are beyond our audible range, but they are uh, speaking on a sound within our audible range and their volume is also enough for us to hear. So if you go to a jungle and really try to listen, then you may be able to hear um, a plant uh, sound. And they also communicate with each other by vibration. So if they can communicate with each other, then our uh, uh, noise, the day-to-day -day noise of modern activities of human beings must be effective and you know, driving them crazy. 
they, they must be crazy about all this noise in Kathmandu. The, the, the plants that is planted on the side of the roads, they must be the craziest plants. And out of all these, the roots are most sensitive to plant. And this has been documented many, many times by different frequency sounds that the roots turns towards the sun. And uh, uh, it also knows where uh, the water is more by the frequency of the sound that in the soil, you know, the sound is different. So they can locate by ecosensing and they go towards the place where there is more sound, you know, more water. So effect of music, can it really help plants? There are many, many experiments people have done. Uh, this is uh, 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 Dr. Bidya Chibukula from India. And uh, he did an experiment where he, uh, uh, in, there, there were different places where we put some uh, markers, internodular distance, and then so that how much uh, uh, the growth achieved in certain period of time, the uh, y axis and x axis. And this was different sounds, okay? And uh, highest, this green one is Indian classical music, and the red one is rock and roll. So, it looks a bit, little bit biased because he's an Indian scientist, but maybe he's true. Maybe he's telling the truth. Other people have also said, a pleasant noise, pleasant sound is good for plants, whereas noisy environment, they don't like it. So if you, they don't, you cannot listen, then how can they, you know, there's a difference. So recently in Barcelona, uh, the opera was closed for many, many months. And the first time they opened opera, they invited, uh, gave ticket to a lot of plants like this. There was only plants. The listeners were only plants and the famous musicians played uh, very nice music to them. And then eventually these plants were given away uh, to uh, the health workers. Uh, frontline healthcare workers during COVID, uh, thinking that these plants can soothe uh, these peoples uh, who have worked very hard during the COVID period. Very, very interesting and uh, cra looks crazy, but um, if you look at from a scientific perspective also, this kind of things uh, looks that it makes some sense on what they are doing. And this is uh, another. As the dancing plant, in the strict sense of the word. Here the man is making music and the plant is, you know, opening up. And then when the music is stopped, it closes. Uh, so this is, uh, I'd like to play it again. Commonly known as the dancing plant. So this is a dancing plant. It's commonly known as a dancing plant. So these plants do not uh, move like this. If you uh, speak to them or make other noise, but then if you give some kind of, you know, rhythmic musical, uh, then they uh, open up. So another, another uh, example that uh, I would like to uh, set here is about gravity. We all know that roots uh, goes down and uh, the plants climbs up. Here is a plant, a plant. Uh, this picture is given by Kini Pan. And uh, here they are planted uh, upside down. You know, and because of the gravity, anti-gravity nature of the plant, it has, this tomato plant has climbed all the way up. I don't know what's happening to the roots. So if there is no light uh, and if there is no gravity, 
like in space garden. Then the, uh, the plant can grow haywire. They don't know where to, which direction to grow. But um, if you can give, create a gravity within a space station, or at least give a light, then the plant can grow towards the light and the root will grow away from the light. And uh, they tried many, many plants in the space and the first plant they, they successfully, you know, one of the successful plant was a Chinese cabbage. And this was uh, actually consumed by the astronauts there so no wonder, you know, it's a Chinese cabbage. They are very good in marketing. So, you know, space uh, vegetation, they have also taken the lead. So light, of course, we know a plant uh, has got uh, towards the light and anti-light, but then a sunflower, all of us know, um, you know, looks towards the light. And uh, not only this, but if you if there's not much light, also the sunflower follows the course of the sun. But if it's a bright light, then it it clearly follows the. Uh, we all know about this, and uh, this is because of the light sensitive pigments on their neck, which makes them move. To, uh, in, and this is all a chemical uh, reaction within the plant. So. Like direction, can they know the calendar? Do they have a calendric? Of course they have. We all know that uh, certain plants grow in certain season. And uh, like uh, in this picture, you can see that uh, in Japan, they have got, uh, you know, the timing of uh, cherry blossom, when the cherry is going to bloom. And uh, they will say, okay, Fukuoka, uh, uh, March 2012, it starts and March 22, within 10 days, it will be finished. No, it's a full bloom it's in, within 10 days. When it starts, when it ends. So it has got a calendar, but how does plant know exactly when to bloom? Where is this, you know, clock that the plant have? Uh, this is a uh, Salais Fulubari in Siraha, uh, in Baisak one, and then uh, there is a foxtail, I think, uh, foxtail, uh, Dendrobium aphylum, uh, which is grown, uh, which uh, bloom there. Many, many uh, foxtails uh, grow there, and then a lot of people go there on this day. And this is very, very surprising for all of us, but they know exactly when to flower. But do they know time? exact time. So Brahma Kamal uh, starts, uh, you know, uh, opening up uh, again, uh, somewhere around nine o'clock, it reaches peak at about nine o'clock and then uh, the flower is finished by one o'clock. So how do they know this, you know? So all of these, uh, all animals, all human living organisms have biological clock within them. Everything, every organism have biological, even uh, the um, bird that fly from a long, long distance for many, many days, you know, without stopping, they also sleep during flight and they shut down one brain and keep one brain open. And they are flying from one brain and then, you know, shut down another brain and they keep on flying. And this is another flower which, uh, which is in the morning, uh, nine o'clock, morning glory, nine o'clock, and this flower uh, give, blooms up. So it's, it's called a circadian uh, clock or the biological clock, which is present in all uh, living animals. And, you know, there's many, many other plants like this, which uh, has got a biological clock like this, time to bloom and then time to grow up within a 24 hour period. Uh, do the plants sleep? Yes, plant also sleep. Uh, this is a study that was done uh, among albeji or silk plant in Japan, uh, where uh, they put the plant into uh, light and dark 
cycles of 12 hours. And then these plants are sleeping and these plants are awake. So, uh, you know, and then you, for, just for video photography, they have brought both plants there. This plant is uh, uh, of Albagia or sail plant, this is sleeping. So some plant may actually uh, sleep like this, but uh, some plant, you know, they may not sleep like that, but then they may have different, you know, um, ways of sleeping, just like the animals. So if we disturb, if we keep this plant into a open state, uh, into a light state for many, many days, then it will just die off because it needs darkness, it needs sleep to survive. So that is another, you know, similarity that I can see. And uh, as we uh, medical doctors know that we have active and passive transport system, active transport depends on energy, ATP and ADP, high and low type of, you know, active transport. A passive is, you know, from high concentration to low concentration in a form of diffusion, you know. So both of these are present in uh, plants and these causes action potentials, which is similar in us. And uh, there's a variation in potentials, local electrical potential, which, is, which can be measured in plants. And there is a systemic uh, action potentials, just like human beings. But they don't have nervous system as such to carry this signal from one place to another. It is carried in different ways, not in the, not in the form of a nervous system. And uh, most of the time when you give stress to a plant, it is harmful. Uh, like here in a cartoon, you know, this is a very, very nice environment for them. The cactus growing nicely in the desert. But the plant which is not used to this environment, if it's planted there, then what is their secret? Huh? I don't know, we really need to find water. So they are in a very stressful situation. Most of the time, these causes mutation, these causes changes in chemicals and uh, difficulties in survival. But sometime, you know, like in this uh, case, uh, Dactyloriza, uh, uh, which is also has got a very high medicinal value found in Himalaya. So high altitude, low oxygen, you know, low temperature. Uh, although they adapt to that environment, they also have high, you know, chemical values. And these chemical values can sometimes be utilized in the form of medicine, which is being done. So like bushfire, you know, uh, they have done a study on bushfires. If you have a controlled bushfire like this, which is also common in Nepal, then um, it helps the soil to regenerate, maintain its pH, maintain its carbon. And um, uh, there's a lot of immediate sprouting. But when it is an uncontrolled wildfire, then uh, there is a lot of damage to the soil itself. And even the, uh, uh, the shoot and the horizontal shoots that you have are also destroyed so that they don't uh, sprout up very easily. And uh, the, the, the place becomes, you know, inhibitant to the plants also for a long, long time to come. Uh, but soil is a good insulator and uh, uh, birds underground are well protected and plants can survive fires by re-sprouting from basal stem and horizontal rhizomes. Again, another example of a stress given to a tissue cultured plant. This is a work from Bijaya and his, her colleague. And um, where uh, the, the tissue cultured plants are given uh, colchicine uh, treated and colchicine untreated uh, ashwagandha, ralphia uh, uh, plants and uh, withinia plants. And um, the chemical structures uh, of the colchicine-induced plants had more uh, uh, 
medicinal value chemicals within them. So sometimes this can do good to the plants also, and then we can utilize that. And uh, by doing this, there's some mutation and new generation, new things comes up. This is a same chicken on the left side is the chicken uh, in captivity, the boiler that we eat all the time. And uh, the right side is the boiler that the same boiler when it is uh, kept outside for just one week and look at the difference. So obviously uh, we need to consider this fact in plants also when we are doing tissue culture within the uh, environment and usually the tissue cultures plants they go to the nature to be uh, acclimatized and I think that's a very good idea and I think these birds also needs to be acclimatized even if you need to eat them you know the uh, natural lifespan of a bird is about five to seven years but then we consume them within six weeks to three months you know so you are, we are uh, manipulating animals' life, plants' life so much, I think. Uh, now, how do the plant communicate? Uh, I have shown you that it can communicate by different methods till now. And there's another very uh, common way of communicating, which is uh, called through the, um, the fungus mycorrhiza, different kind of fungus uh, within the uh, soil itself. And uh, this is uh, one of the scientists call this the worldwide wave, wood white wave. And they can transfer different nutrients from one plant to another, support one plant. You know, it's like a community living together, supporting each other and then communicating at the same time, you know. So uh, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of study uh, about mycorrhiza, different kind of mycorrhiza which is, so there's a big uh, network of communication and uh, life um, below the earth itself. And this is uh, again, the picture of a uh, root with the mycorrhiza and a stump which should be dead, it can be kept a lot by a nearby tree uh, through intercoronating root system, just like this. So that, you know, they keep on having food even though they don't have anything uh, above them. Or before these trees die out through this uh, interconnection of mycorrhiza and network of uh, the roots, they give away all their nutrients to the surrounding, you know, just like when we die, we give our belongings to our children. The same way they give away all the minerals, all the nutrients to the surrounding structures and then die. So when we talk about do plants have sense, do, do, can they think, if they can think, where is their brain, you know? So I, we all know there is no brain in the in plant, but they can work singly, uh, collectively, or in a very, very big mass, just like we just saw in rhizo, you know, mycorrhiza, they can communicate within the jungle, thousands of trees can communicate together and one jungle can communicate with another jungle. And here is um, a picture of a root, which is uh, you know, elongating and growing. Uh, uh, there is a space, but then whenever it is growing, it is you know trying to palpate and see where it is growing. And if you, uh, I don't have this video, I just have a picture, but you see that it is actually moving like this. So there is a, you know, uh, structures which is similar to human muscles there on the tip of the root and, uh, and also the sense of touch. So, but this one, when the tip is cut, that movement goes away, but it keeps on growing, you know, because the transitional zone is not cut, so it grows but then it doesn't have that sense of feeling. So uh, in this paper, Darwin said that the brain of the plant is in the root. And uh, he wrote this uh, together with his son, Frankis Darwin. And uh, 
uh, had this picture like this where you know this is depicting a plant and that's the brain which is the root and then they are growing up so this was um, the Darwin's hypothesis and which is being proved right now that the main thinking is being done main intelligence is being done by uh, the root itself so now do the plant the plant itself the totality of the plant itself have consciousness now if we collectively say all these things bring this together then this is consciousness uh, just like human beings then can we take out the consciousness from plants so uh, this is uh, Annals of Botany. This is a research done in Annals of Botany, where you know this pitcher plant, the the carnivorous plant, was uh, anesthetized with ether, which we use uh, in the uh, in our operation theater. And once you use the ether, then they stopped closing. You know, even if you give a mosquito, they don't close. So you can, and if you can anesthetize a plant, that means that uh, and it has got sensation and consciousness. It has got consciousness because we make patient unconscious by uh, doing this. So uh, if you talk about science and scientists, we all know that science is not static. It is always changing and it is not an ultimate truth new truth is always arriving and you will change your own concept two years or more, even faster, you know. So don't be dogmatic. You should be prepared to be changed just like a child. Science is not black and white. There's always a certain degree of uncertainty. That's why we all talk about P values and probabilities, you know. And uh, scientists should be childish, young at heart, and always ready to learn and ready to question. Good scientists are those who know very little and are curious to know, especially those who can ignore memories. Because memories kills curiosity. And once you know and you have that in your memory, you don't want to go beyond that. And uh, they should have some degree of synesthesia. Synesthesia means, you know, you can smell music or you can see music dancing or something like that different perception of you know the um, stimuli but it, if it becomes more then you become a poet you know rather than a scientist and if you become too much then you become a mad person and uh, Some facts about uh, our sit situation that I want to mention is uh, almost none of the research is uh, linked to finance because uh, big institution, I think some of them, some of the research should be linked with the finance so that our, you know, the research outcome is converted into some kind of financial gain. Although it's not necessary, uh, just to know maybe enough at times. And there is no continuity of our research, you know. Each student with uh, new students will do new research and then, you know, it is not uh, extended into the another uh, continuation of research. So there's no baton touch race, you know, in, in our area. So this has to be improved. Uh, and we continue to rely on data generated in other countries with very different genetic and physiological and environmental background. And we cannot copy paste these things uh, in our setup. And uh, on dissertation, you get good marks if you do complicated research rather than simple ones. But simple ones are the ones that are the applied science that we can use. Uh, this gentleman, Jagdish Chandra Bose, a long time ago, you know, almost 1926, he presented about plants have feelings. Boss lectures on normal system of plants in Paris in 1926. So East, in, in our part of the world, we have people like him and many others 
who have done wonderful work in, uh, you know, and he laid the foundation of experimental science in Indian subcontinent, which includes us also. And if you look at our Eastern, you know, today's lecture is not on, you know, this, but then I just want to touch with one slide. Uh, this is this is science. This is Eastern philosophy. This is the distance of uh, Earth and Sun, and uh, the science says this much of kilometer. The Eastern philosophy, which is based on Hanuman Chalisa, calculated from that, is about this kilometer, which is almost the same, few few thousand kilometer, and you know that Sun is rotating on an oval circle, so it depends when you have measured it. How can they measure? so accurately, you know, many, many thousand years ago. And species in the world, the science says is about 8.7 million, we say 8.4 million, almost same. Albert Einstein says energy can neither be created or nor be destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to the another. And uh, Krishna, uh, Krishna said in Gita, similar thing. We, he said that soul can neither be created nor be destroyed, soul is energy and it just transfer from one body to another. If you look at the unit of, let's say time, one second is 1000 millisecond, one millisecond is 1000 microsecond, and one microsecond is 1000 nanosecond. And we have a unit of time where the last unit is Truti, and uh, 31 nanoseconds, one Truti is equals to 31 nanosecond, which is this much of decimal, of a second. So you can see how precisely we could, you know, uh, calculate time and uh, measure things uh, on its scale. And Vedic astrology can predict solar eclipse after 10,000 years. What, when will the solar eclipse, when, exactly where time and uh, uh, from where you can see full moon or half moon or whatever. And uh, so this is, you know, very, very high level of science. Sometimes NASA even follow what they are, you know, NASA used to verify what they are doing. And uh, this world is full of illusion. And we talk about evidence-based medicine and everything we talk is um, valued in terms of mathematics and uh, talk about things we can only measure but we know there are many things which we cannot measure. We can only feel that they are there. So, in, so is the intelligence of a plant, you know. Uh, they also feel the pain, they hear. And uh, so if you look at this graph, then you can see that this is the spectrum where people can hear sound. But these sounds, these sounds are only, you know, can be heard by dogs and cats and, you know, dolphin and things like that. And light, this is the only light spectrum that we can, very small spectrum of light we can, uh, very little light spectrum that we can uh, uh, perceive. Others X-ray, Y rays, we cannot perceive. In the same way, all of the pictures that we see are inverted in our retina through the lens. And we actually are seeing the world upside down, but we don't see it like that. And taste is also uh, an illusion, a smell is illusion, and color is the biggest illusion in the world. Like a red apple is everything but not red, because red is being emitted uh, and rest, <coughs> red is being emitted, rest is being absorbed. So uh, this is my last slide. <coughs> this is uh, Amazon uh, in, uh, Dead Valley in California, sorry, where uh, there is no rain, so there is no animal, so they nothing grows there. So they say, you know, it's a dead valley, nothing is there, no plants, nothing. Maybe small lizards are there, and that's it. In 2004, there was a rain in Dead Valley, and then this is what you saw. So Dead Valley is not actually dead, you know, and there are plants which are living there and they can sprout out and then rejuvenate the earth again. And that is what is happening all the time. Whenever we are in trouble, plants have supported the environment in such an extent that we could survive. So we should respect and uh, 
lead to you know real real learn to live together with them in a more environmental friendly ways thank you very much and if you have missed some of this uh, uh, then please uh, go to the youtube the yeti show and then you can uh, watch it uh, we will upload it by tonight and thank you very much uh, botanist all over nepal for giving me this opportunity wonderful opportunity to talk uh, i'm sorry uh, that i'm not a professional on this and uh, i i welcome your questions if there is any but not about pure botany uh, you can ask me about uh, neuroscience thank you very much